Team Human is an ad-free listener-supported project made possible by teammates like Evoluti, Gary Crane, Brian Gathy, Bahara Hosseini, Chris Aperos, Dave, and hopefully you. Just go to teamhuman.fm and click on support to find the others who gain access to our Discord channel, my paywalled medium posts, archives of my collected work, and conversations with luminaries like Timothy Leary and Terrence McKenna, and participation in our live Team Human salons in the Kibitz Room. See you there. You're on Team Human, Conscious Intervention in the Machine, shining a light on the interstitial, the liminal space between you and me, us and them, so that the lines distinguishing us from one another just disappear. It's that easy. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and I'm on Team Human. Playing for Team Human today, the lighting genius behind Pink Floyd and Bruce Springsteen, the Empire State Building, experienced designer and artist Mark Brickman. It's about being able to literally affect a a person, whether it's a small crowd or a crowd of 100,000, or I've gone as high as 250,000 people in one place. But it's in that moment. It's in that moment when it all comes together and there's the negative space, just like in painting. You have that You have what you don't know. It's the mystery. Mark is going to show us how centering the person in the very last row of the theater makes an experience better for everyone. It's time to intervene on our own behalf. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and we're all on Team Human. I just finished recording the uh, audiobook for my upcoming book, Survival of the Richest. Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires, which, yes, it would help me out if you order it or pre-order it at your favorite bookstore right now. And it would help you out because it's fun and crazy and really does help make sense of this moment. But I'm not I'm not talking about it in order to pitch it um, so much as to share, uh, I guess, my own impression after reading it out loud like that. I I kind of saw a through line that I don't know if I really talk about in the book itself. And I mean, the book, you know, on the, on the surface, it's, it's based on that story I told a few years ago about the tech billionaires that I met that wanted uh, advice on their, on their bunkers. And it was really more of a, a metaphor for them, I feel, although they, they did want actual advice and water testing of their bunker strategies. They were more really... Uh, sharing with me their their uh, sense that they had to isolate or separate or rise above the rest of humanity before we all uh, went down and before we all disappeared. And so I wrote this book about their mindset. You know what what kind of mindset leads a person to uh, uh, really see humanity as as kind of the st- first stage of a rocket that you have to leave behind in order to win, in order to succeed. <laughs> Success means getting out of here. And global catastrophe it just is justification for uh, trying to get out and away from everybody else in the first place. It's not really the, the, uh, the cause of this thinking. It's more a, a later rationalization for thinking this way. But what struck me as I read the book out loud was the way the way these dudes have reached in the limits of their ability to use money and technology to insulate themselves from the rest of the world. That that's the reason they've been accumulating money, the same as anybody, you know, is to have retirement, is to have a buffer, is to have some protection against all the the others. And technology, of course, they developed, you know, in order to be able to have some virtual reality protection simulation, Amazon doorbell, you know, Jeffersonian dumbwaiter insulation from the the teeming masses. But what I realized was, you know, they they had reached the limits of their ability to outrun the 
externalized damage they were causing and the resentment they were creating. The The industrial age was really all about earning enough money so you could kind of run faster than the exhaust coming out of the, your own your own tailpipe. And they reached the limits of that. They, they, they reached the limits of even the kinds of exponential growth that you can get through industrial monopolies. But the addition of digital technology is really, for me, is the new element here. Digital kind of realizes what the postmodernists were talking about before digital even existed, that digital gives us the ability to go meta, to rise to one level above. You know, digital is about, uh, it's a symbol system. It, it's once removed. It's 10x. And that's really what all these guys are thinking. We can be as gods, like Stuart Brand told them. We can go one level above. It's what Peter Thiel means when he says, and he writes this, you know, idea of, of zero to one, that that's what you want your business to do, to go from zero to one. It's such a digital thing, right? Zero or one. Are you down with the zeros? Are you one order of magnitude above everybody else? You are web two when they're just web one. They're trying to run businesses, but you create the platform that aggregates those businesses because you are one level above, or in that case, kind of below. But but you're an order of magnitude higher than everybody else. Or Mark Zuckerberg, when Facebook finally, people realize Facebook's kind of failing, both as a cool thing and its, its subscriptions have peaked, you know, like, like Netflix or anything. It peaked. So what does Zuckerberg do? He invents a company literally called Meta one level above, right? It's a brand of Web3, VR, crypto, whatever it's about, but it's just meta. Or or Jeffrey uh, Epstein, who I write about in the book too. What is his worldview? Is that he is a god uh, uh, presiding over a slave race of women who are going to carry his seeds forward. It's what it's it's why he supports the work of someone or did someone like Richard Dawkins. Because what does Richard Dawkins say? That oh, what are people? They're just being run by their genes. They're nothing, right? We're 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 blindly following the programming of our selfish genes, and that's all we are, then what is the job of, of a superior but to dominate those people or, or businesses in this environment? What, what, what is a digital business? A digital business is basically a stock listing or a derivative or a derivative of that. Everything is once removed. Even the idea of being, uh, what do these guys call it? Self-sovereign. That's like the high, <laughs> the, the, the high uh, uh, goal is to become a self-sovereign individual. What is a self-sovereign? You mean you're king of yourself. So you are yourself, but you're also once removed from yourself, being the ruler of yourself. What What is virtual reality but one level above or outside reality? So that's really what, what I'm seeing in chapter after chapter, story after story in that book is people trying to get once removed, to go meta on everything. And that's why you know what their greatest fear is? These tech bro dudes, their greatest fear, it's not climate change. Now they think they're going to escape from that or build something or get, get out of that with some techno solution. What their real fear is artificial intelligence. And why? Because artificial intelligence is going to be able to go meta on them. That's their great fear, right? They're so busy going meta on us and on nature, on women, on physical reality. But AI, uh-oh, it's going to go meta on them. And that's why going meta, going once removed, is not the winning strategy. No, don't remove yourself from the others. Join the others. That's why we're here. That's why we're on Team Human. One of the great 
things about having lived a long time is that I've met so many weird, wonderful, interesting people along the way that I don't even remember them all unless they resurface for one reason or another. And then, bam, it's like, oh, wow, right. I've had this lovely person in my life. So when my friend Jeff Newell reconnected me with Mark Brickman, Honestly, at first I was like, who was that? I kind of remember that name. And then I remembered he, I met Mark like in the very last months of Timothy Leary's life. He was another friend of Leary and he was doing the, uh, the lighting design for, uh, uh, the experience design, really, for uh, Pink Floyd's concert. And I remember Tim went to that concert. It was just a few weeks before he died. And he came back home, and his eyes were, like, so wide, as if, and he wasn't, as if he were tripping. And he said, that was the best event I've been to in my entire life. And imagine that, you know, <laughs> 76 at that point, to have to have created the event that was the greatest thing Timothy Leary had ever been to. Uh, and and uh, I ended up hanging out with Mark a bit, just, you know, a couple of coffees in L.A. It was a, it was a difficult time for a lot of us because we were losing Tim. But um, I'm glad I got to, I got to reconnect with him now. Um, Mark is a Gosh, it's hard to describe. You'll find out uh, when you listen to this conversation. He's an experienced designer and a, a guy who's really thinking about that person in the back row. How do we bring a whole group of people together and how do we center the the one who's on the fringe, the most vulnerable? How do we fold the fringes back into the middle and keep culture alive with the weird. Um, so here's my conversation with my friend, Mark Brickman. So Mark Brickman, gosh, when I'm trying to remember exactly when and where we met live. I'm going to say it was the mid nineties. It was, uh, it was probably, look at this. It was probably sometime near this. Oh, oh my God. I'm showing uh, Mark a picture of uh, me and Timothy Leary together. And Tim has on him the sticker, the Pink Floyd World Tour 1994 mixer from 17th April, 1994. Yeah, so you know that story. It's actually posted on my Instagram account. It was just about the house lights were about to turn off for that show. And I get over the headphones, I get this, I hold the house lights. <laughs> um, you have a chair next to you. And I, yeah. You know, my parents were sitting behind me that evening. And so um, <laughs> this guy comes out. I look up and it's Tim Leary. And I'm like, wow. OK. <laughs> and he sits down and he looks at me and, he, and I'm holding and the crowds going crazy. I'm still holding the house lights. And, you know, I said to him, wow, it's like great to, to really finally meet. We're having this little conversation. Uh -huh. I haven't started the show. The band's waiting. And, you know, it, <laughs> and and. And we're having this conversation, and he finally says to me, why are you wearing headphones? I said, well, I direct the whole show live. And he goes, great. You have an extra pair. And I said, <gasps> yeah. So I gave him a pair of headphones. We start the show. At intermission, he takes the headphones off. It's probably one of the best moments of my life. He turns to me and says, that's the best thing I have ever seen. And I went, Best? Ever? <laughs> like, mm. ever? <laughs> he came back to the house. I was there the night he went to that show. I went to another. They did like five, they did like five shows in LA yeah. right then. It was a bunch. Yeah, we did. And we did. it was the tour for the, the, D, the CD that had the little red flashing light, I think. Or maybe it was the record before that. No, it was, it was 87. So it was momentary lapse of reason. Uh -huh. And after he said that, I said, could you do me a favor? And he goes, yeah, man. It's so, you know, I'm just right. I can't wait for a second. Hell, what, mm -hmm. what do you need? And I went, my mother and father are sitting behind us. <laughs> Would you mind saying hello to my mother? Now, when I was growing up, Timothy Leary was enemy number one in yeah. my house. Right. Yeah. Enemy number one. So- we turn around and I went, mom and dad, Tim Leary. Hmm. And my mother was, it was just like a sheet of ice. <laughs> <on her face. laughs> 
<laughs> it's like you got it Charlie like, Manson sitting there or something. Oh, yeah. 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 But even better, I, I never had to get therapy because my therapy was, I, that happened a number of times that my mother was confronted with these evil people that were always thrown at me during my childhood. So when she's actually, con- like Paul McCartney was another one. Mm. And when she was finally confronted with them, I, it, for me, it was like, wow, the, uh, you could talk about it forever, but to actually see the reaction of humans in that moment, for me, mm. is always the, the, the real truth. And we must have met then back at his house in the 80s or, or maybe even the early 90s once he got sick. I think, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was probably late 80s, early 90s, maybe it was early 90s. Do, do you know Greg Diocampo from Emergency Broadcast Network? Mm-hmm. Right. No, you do know them? I think yeah. I might have met you through them, actually, through um, right. Josh and Greg. G- geniuses. Those guys yeah. are geniuses. I know. Absolute you know, real geniuses. Geniuses really did gather around Tim because so many people were inspired by him in high school and college and, you know, yep. his sort of his 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 worldview, which was, you know, both scientific, neurological, psychological and sort of mythological all at once. So those of us like you who are into kind of technology, spirituality and the arts and what and that acid. means no. and acid. <laughs> well, I hate to say it, but yeah, no, maybe I'm, I shouldn't I'm hate sorry. to say it, but it is true. And LSD, you know, because we came to similar understandings of our collective status, you know, what I'm calling team we human, did. that there's one thing going on here. I mean, and that's what I love about your work, that your work, for people who don't know, you do, I mean, we can loosely call it lighting, but it's basically almost like environmental design. That's right. Yeah. The lighting tag has always bothered me. Because re- everything you just said is exactly the foundation of where it comes from after years of doing it now. But you know you know how the entertainment business is where they just put you in the little box and, and open and close the door and, right. and that's it. You're done. So over the years, I've, I've transformed myself into an artist. I, I, fe- I feel that's a, a more general term, but mm. environmental is ap- – it's sitting in audiences for 50 years – In the moment, in the actual moment when the music, the light, you know, the environment, the visual, but this is before video screens. So Mm. you had the band, you had the music, you had their performance. But then that music, before I got to the venue, I used to listen in headphones. And so Mm. what the picture was for me or what I felt, that was really communicated through all the lighting I did. And as technology grew, I kept growing and, and pushing the boundaries. I've been very lucky. So as a kid, you obviously listened to the great music, but were you like doing lighting design for plays and things at school? I mean, how did you find lights? I started lighting in 10th grade. I went to this school in Philadelphia, second oldest high school in the country called Second uh, Central High School. And it was all academic. It was like a magnet school. My dad mm-hmm. went there also. It was founded in 1836. Mm-hmm. And in 10th grade, you know, it was 1967. You know, it was a different time. I mean, or 68. And um, it was a different time. But marijuana started really coming in. Uh-huh. And, I, and I was in charge of the sophomore hop committee. And mm-hmm. uh, I wanted a light show in the gym. And I found this guy out in uh, Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, and I brought him in. And by the end of the evening, we were, me and Buddy, we were buying the light show from him because mm. we found it to be so incredibly great. And we used to take it on the weekends to do like record hops and things. For some reason, the radio station in Philadelphia found out about me. And the next thing I know, I'm getting phone calls to do uh, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Maynard Ferguson, uh, Johnny Mathis. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, when you do that, so they're, they're at a venue. The venue has set lights, so you bring in a show. No, I was bringing lights in, and I was renting lights from this local lighting company that had been in business 50 years. I ended up owning it about five, four God. years later. And these were regular lights? I mean, these are like Fernells yeah. and Lico's. I mean, the old yeah, school, yeah. and you put gels in them. And little- Yeah, I, I knew right. nothing about it. I think what I really knew was the music always moved me. My mm. uncle, 
used to play saxophone in Tommy Dorsey's band. He mm. gave me my first clarinet and uh, cameras and things. So I, I feel like my you know, I got kicked out of college because I didn't go to gym. And so ah. I, you know, <laughs> and my dad looked at me and said, well, I guess you have to get a job. What about that? The lighting thing you've been doing? Why don't you go do that for real? And I went, sure. Ugh. My parents were always very supportive. Oh, my God. And it just grew. It just grew. It's like Springsteen. That's how Springsteen and I started. I showed up at Widener College in 72 in, in a station wagon full of lights. I was hired as an outside contractor. And Mike Capel shows up with this drill sergeant hat on. And uh-huh. I knew every cue of the music because I was a fan. And I was hired immediately after that mm. with to do all Bruce's shows. So right. it grew organically. And those were the early days. I mean, 72, 73, that's, that's, you know, he was still doing like Max Kansas City and places like that yeah. then. This was the and early. when we did the bottom yeah. line, I guess it was, bottom line was 74 maybe mm-hmm. the first time. It was a really big deal. Clive Davis went backstage, kind of uh. like what Leary did, and told them, you have to hire this guy full time. You can't do a show without him, you know. And the, so that catapulted mm. me into this limelight of and it really in 74 the industry was just still yeah. in its infancy do you think you were doing something different i mean there was on the west coast there were the acid tests and people were using lights and oil immersion projections on sheets and things so but nothing was in sync mm. it's all about that it's about that moment it's about being able to literally affect a a person, whether it's a small crowd or a crowd of a hundred thousand, or I've gone as high as two hundred and fifty thousand right. people in one place. But it's in that moment. It's in that moment when right. it all comes together and there's the negative space, just like in painting. You have that you have what you don't know. It's the mystery that really I feel I'm a master at that now. Mm. I was reading some of it's way later, but I was reading some of the reviews of the first Olympic that you did, the Olympics opening ceremony. And the thing everyone was freaking out about was he started in darkness as if it yeah. was like, huh? But it's like, read the Bible. It's everything. It's, of course we start. It's like, duh, but nobody did it before. Well, you know, <laughs> we, we live in America and unfortunately, America is, especially when it comes to television production like that there is no heart so there's a man mm. called pepo soul he's no longer with us but he was really the visionary of the barcelona olympics and he 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 was such an amazing visionary and when i first walked into the stadium i remember him calling me up and saying you know i have a whole long list of people and they were all the normal lighting people that do um tv and he says i come to your name and he says oh, everybody else's name says safe I come to your name and it says risk. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, please come to Barcelona in the very, you know, big, big, big voice. So when I walked in there, I remember looking around and thinking to myself, you know, because of what he described that he wanted to do, you have to turn the lights off. Mm. It's like a blank canvas. And then the, your imagination, your brain, to me, that's the most fascinating part of that. It's not like in this day and age, everything looks, it's just so blown out. The noise is is overwhelming Mm. and nothing is different. Um, So, and that's a general statement. The shift for your, your show though, was like, it's like the Olympics opening ceremonies were always kind of really ringling brothers. And you kind of took it like, oh, but what if we go Cirque du Soleil? In other words, yeah. right go, before go Cirque minim- du Soleil, right before yeah. they existed, of course. But but you go minimalist, and then all of a sudden, the lights and human form and life emerge from the darkness as a phenomenon, rather than as you know pure spectacle. Correct, and 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 the acts and the way he crafted the show, Peppo was so beautiful. The closing ceremonies were so crazy. They, they had the fire with this band of uh, artists in street artists in Barcelona called the comedians and um, it was magnificent and here's the best I guess analogy or, or story about that at the closing ceremony in the afternoon we were handing over to Atlanta and you know for the next ceremony for 96 and uh, th- the American committee USA committee is out on the stage practicing and it's all these gymnasts and uh-huh. all kinds of people cheerleaders and um 
Peppo says to me, suddenly this mascot comes bounding out on the stage like like Mickey Mouse, but it, you couldn't tell what it is. And Peppo looks at me and he says to me, hey, Brickman, look, your countrymen, what is it? And I went, <laughs> I don't know. What is it? He, and, and he goes, no, no, no. What is it? And I went, what is it? I, I, I don't know. He goes, Brickman, the name of the mascot is called What Is It? <laughs> it's like who's on first uh, i was so embarrassed <laughs> to be american i was like oh my who god does that oh my god well i don't i've been again i've been so lucky in my life to been able to live outside of america for years mm. and then come back that and to, to experience cultures throughout the world and people and just that was the best part of this life I had it just never mm. got boring in where I was but you did so for years you would go on the road with the band and do live shows I mean at the time lighting lighting boards were all levers yeah, so you're yeah, just yeah. massively going up and down with with I guess eventually you you made your own gear so you could hit buttons instead of moving well, sliders. Well, in eighty seven, right? yeah, in eighty seven, the tour that would Tim Tim came to was the first time that I actually created an orchestra of technicians, which is mm. now the industry standard. But back right. then, I I realized that everything was now computerized, and what was going to really work to, what, for what was in my brain mm -hmm. was I needed to create my own band, the, the Merry Pranksters, my mm -hmm. own version of it. And it worked really well. It worked really well. Right. And if you go to uh, like the lineage now, like you go to a fish show and they're doing a state of the art version of what you had started there. I mean, the fish cool. shows, the that's thing right. that's great about them, they'll, they'll, I mean, they have maybe 3,000 different hours of music they can play, but their lighting is absolutely coordinated with the rhythm of the music, the peaks, and that that's makes right. everybody go nuts as if they're having synesthesia. But they're not. It's it is. Well, they it's, are. It's, and, <laughs> no, they absolutely are. And, and Chris Kuroda, who's the designer artist that does fish for, and he's been there forever. He's really mm. talented, and and he's a really great. That whole crew, I, I know a lot of them, and and um, they're absolutely they are amazing. They had amazing. whales yep. floating around, and yep. I mean, they are they are playing with the band, you know, and the crowd. No, they're and, playing and doing with the band. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And after Springsteen. You know, the, the Floyd thing came up mm. and I actually got Pink Floyd because of Alan Parker and um, he came to a show. Really? The Wall? The movie? Yeah. Pink Floyd hired me the night before they opened The Wall here in L.A. Literally mm. the day before I got a phone call. To, they had been here building the show for a month or six weeks. The night before they called me and said, we need help. And that was uh, uh, Roger Waters and Alan Parker and Gerald Scarf all freaking out. And so... <laughs> Not the night before the movie, the night before the concert? The night before the concert, the original one. Yeah. So what do you do? How, wait, so what time do you... I got to hear, what time did you show up? And what time were they supposed to just go on? <laughs> well, it was the night before, so I had less oh, than had 24 oh, okay. hours. Oh, fine. Yeah. You had a day. Oh, that's, oh, oh. I, was, I thought it was a dramatic thing. Oh, oh, yeah, no, oh. And, and, and remember, there were, no, there were no moving lights or computers. It was all right. like, like, yeah. But again- So what do you do? Getting, you, you put it in order with Mole Richardson? What does someone do it at the last really minute simple. like that? It's, you turn the lights off. Because what was going on was, if you go back and look at it, it and still to this day, no one has ever, not even Roger himself, has recreated it correctly in terms of the impact of this opera that he mm. wrote, right? And the band performed, right? And even in the version 2010, it became such a commercialized, get it out there, live nation thing. You really right. lost the story. The story became something else. And it's not a criticism. Yeah. It just back then, it was, it, it yeah. was so monumental, but I know what you mean. I always felt like it it never got fully realized in the quadrophenia way. They kept holding back from what that the cohesiveness of that album, the real right. message of the album. Yeah. But a a Alan Parker had seen a Springsteen show. And uh, what impressed him the most was, again, the drama, the cueing, like you would right. find in a theatrical production. It wasn't a rock and roll, just the generic flashlights and just have them all over the place. It was actually the darkness and most of the acts that I've worked with, most of the, I've been, again, talented, is because they always saw, 
when they would go to a show, they would see, like, I, I started with Springsteen, and he had no front light. I would keep him in a silhouette to tell his right. stories. Because everyone could then relate to who he was. It, it created this persona. Right. I remember those shows. And he becomes iconic, and then you can sort of see your own face on him. Correct. Rather, that's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But that's, that's exactly right. But then in the moments, though, because those those songs, like Rosalita, you know. Oh, yeah, and, no, uh, there, they, there was they the big peak. moments. And you get this timed stuff at the end of the shows coming from behind the drums. The da 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 You know, yeah. <laughs> you'd have these yeah, bright, but that, white but that's, hits. You're riding, yeah, you're riding the wave. It's like surfing. You're riding the wave. Right. And that's really, a, so even to this day, it, uh, I've shifted from those kind of shows because they don't really exist anymore. Except mm. for maybe if like David Gilmore would go out again, I'd maybe do that. Um, or Steve Miller. Um, well, Roger Waters is out Young. right now. No, no, no. I left. I left Roger in 2010, and mm. I helped him put the wall back together again with one other um, designer called Mark Fisher, the original architect of the wall. Mark passed on in 2013. But mm. what's out there right now? I, I've seen things on Instagram. I, I, I wouldn't. I, God bless Roger. Yeah. Oh, he's still doing beautiful music. And Tiny Tim. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. he's got such such good uh, uh, stage energy. I mean... But at, at that point now, he's 78 years old. Yeah. Do you really need to keep, like, selling the extravaganza since everybody else is doing and has copied you? Wouldn't you innovate in a mm. way that using all the technology and all the power and wealth and everything else you have to really create a live and lasting piece of art that that mm. kind of you know doesn't keep you know imitating yourself been there done that's that that's what i right. always want yeah i know i would yeah. love to have seen him go in almost a leonard cohn direction get super exactly. intimate who are you you know who is this soul because we're all there we're all you know we'll all show up you know perfect example <laughs> Perfect examples. They had that uh, old cella a few years ago. You know, where right. it was uh, Dylan and and the Stones, and then it was the second night. It was uh, Neil Young, Paul McCartney, and the third night was um, I forget who it was. It was somebody and and Roger, and the whole stage was built for Roger with this huge screen. It was a massive screen, and I was working with Neil at the time. And I remember saying to him, like. We can't use that screen. It's Roger. <laughs> the, the promoter agreed to putting up the 300 foot wide screen because for me, those screens are, you're just, why bother show? Why should the artists even show right. up? You don't even need them. You can't yep. see them. They I look, saw production of West Side Story, the Broadway production in New York with a giant video screen in the back wall. I'm like, you're upstaging these poor kids who are trying to do a fucking show. What? Exactly. I can see the movie in the movie theater. I want to see live theater. <laughs> exactly. So, I, so, New Neil says to me, yeah, Neil had a couple ideas. We tried them. They didn't really work. So then mm. he said, he said, you, so you want to cover it up? I go, yeah, I want to cover it up. I, I, uh. Maybe two little screens at the edges so they can see you close up. I said, but the energy was really with you and a promise of the real, which is Willie Nelson's boys, Lucas mm. and Micah and the rest of the band. But that energy of that young band and Neil, the, you know, the mm. master. And when they really got into it, I, that's all I wanted to see. Right. And so what I did was I designed a show just with 16 follow spots, no other lighting. The whole rig at Coachella, I didn't use. The whole, this massive amount of lights <laughs> for McCartney and Waters. I made them put up follow spots you know with guys human, to follow human 16 them. humans 16 humans up there with white yeah. light and it was all white light all the time uh, and then and then neil said great let's cover it up with burlap and that's where he got the in and daryl made uh -huh. the seeds the organic seed logo and then suddenly tp showed up because it was around that time with the pipeline up in dakota you know and mm -hmm. it was amazing it was so mm. magical and even the Harvest Moon came up on cue the first night. You know, it, it really did. Uh, but that was so probably the point when Neil didn't need anything else. The music spoke for itself. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was a theater director way back. And in some ways, you need 
a, a certain kind of discipline that as a young person I didn't have. My plays, if I had to do a play in a black box theater in a basement with six pillars in the way, I would be genius. I would find a way to do, you know, long day's journey into night in a maze <laughs> of cement, right? But when they let me as a senior or as a professional go in the big, beautiful house with anything and the wings and the flying in, I would suck because it's yeah. like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Well, I, yeah, I it's needed like walking the lim- into Costco. You're right. It's like, well, right. it's like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get overwhelmed, right? Yeah. yeah. I understand. So what you did, what you have though, it's a discipline is to go, wait a minute, I'm not going to use everything at my disposal. I'm going to start with zero and build Correct. up slowly. It's That's such right. a an That's anti-American, I know what you mean, sensibility of like, no, 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 no. And it's not denial. It's not being ascetic or, or denying yourself something. It's not at all. You know what it's like? Well, what it's like, it's all about the audience. And for me, mm-hmm. I'm still that kid in the last row in 1973 at the Tower Theater in Philadelphia watching Ziggy Stardust. Uh, and knowing that I was going to get, I'm not know if I can say this. I, I, knowing that my girlfriend and I were going to have relations later on in the, in the <laughs> evening because I was a hero because I found I got into the show. It didn't matter where I was sitting, but he communicated that energy from the stage mm. all the way to the last row. And if you can grab those people in the very back without distraction and keep everyone involved, I'm always in touch. It's not about me. It's really about, like you said earlier, the environment. Did Mm. you see, um, I think the greatest music thing they've ever done on Broadway is David Byrne's um, um, Utopia. Mm. Um, Did you do that? I started with David in the very, very beginning. I was er, er, Mm. involved with him early on when the concept was there and I did a bunch Mm -hmm. of renderings. And then something happened. I don't remember, but... He, it got postponed for a while, and right. we both went our ways. And but I went nine times. I went six uh, times. Yeah. right before the pandemic, and my buddy Steve Miller went nine times. Oh, it was great. The light was spatial. It was spatial oh, light. The whole you know, thing. It was, a, it was just yeah. yeah. It was just. It was a masterpiece. Yep. And at the end, basically, he does. You know, I put it in in my new book. I got it's in the last paragraph of my new book. I quote. The end of that, where he says, um, he's kind of talking about about polyvagal theory. I said, uh, 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 in American Utopia, David Byrne mused on what recent discoveries about the brain tell us about this journey toward true connectivity. While the millions of unused connections in our brain are pruned as we grow into adults, perhaps they get reestablished. Only now, instead of being in our heads, they are between us and other people. Who we are is, thankfully, not just here, but it extends beyond ourselves through the connections between all of us. And right? that's your work. And I mean, yep. that, well, that, well that, that's Dave. I mean, David is, it's my work, but just imagine, seriously, especially in this day and age with all the younger people now doing, and the artists, there is a lot of other people that go unnoticed that have no outlet, no place mm-hmm. to actually perform and, and to connect like that and to take that same thought and feeling onward into the next generation. You know, I mean, very few people really, the way you just, and I for, I remembered him saying most of that, but not, you know, it was, wow, I was just sitting <laughs> here going, that. <laughs> There it is, you know. That's what I'm working on these days. I, I'm, right. I'm I, I've removed myself a bit from the mainstream, and I, I'm finding a way to really use all the tools of technology now to actually, because they're there, and the distribution system and the gatekeepers have been removed, but to find a way that the narrow casting of communities and the artists have a voice and they're able to monetize their work. Mm-hmm. But the big main big boy media, you know, I mean, they're just deaf to all of yeah. it that's going on. Well, you know? they're deaf to, they're deaf to, and I love your your uh, expression of the kid in the back row of the theater, you know, which is another way of saying what, what you know, our social justice warriors are trying to get us to understand. Who is the most disadvantaged? Who is the most vulnerable? And how do we center them rather than exclude them? So your work is exactly. so much, like when I think about, I mean, and people don't know, you've did a, done a lot of public work, I guess we can call it as well, public works, like during the pandemic, you did the pandemic. Empire State Building 
show. <laughs> what do we call it? Installation thing? I mean, and what you did and all the rhetoric around it was like, everybody is so alone, so isolated in the pandemic. And here in the central beacon of our city, this thing happened. I mean, can you describe how well, that there came was, about? There was actually... Yeah, I, I mean, I've been really lucky with Empire State Building. I've been there 10 years, and the mm. owner of the building, Anthony Malkin, he's uh, just another visionary, another Pepo soul, just an amazing guy. But he's also the owner of the Empire State Building. So <laughs> you have to find the – at times when I pitch things, they don't always go. What happened the pandemic, there was also another – opportunity, which I, I now what I do is I jump in feet first. So mm. I discovered, do you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, they wanted to uh, honor the first responders. And we did this thing with red and white and people started yeah. like ha really having a bad reaction, really bad reaction. They thought it was a, the nuclear war was coming and, uh. you know, it was, everybody was in fear. Right. And so we had to do a test in the middle of the night and I heard these tones because I'm here in Malibu and we were, I can do everything remotely. And right. I remember seeing the tones and the light going off as a test. And I thought to myself, oh, that's Simon. Simon, Simon says, yeah. yeah. I remember Simon was the, Simon says you push yeah. these, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. it does these, these four primary colors sort of in order right. and then you have to keep and going. Yeah. So I built an app to place Simon on the building for everybody that was at home. You could look out your window, you could walk down the street, most people weren't doing that anymore, but you could look out, your window. there's like a million people with a view of the empire, and you could play Simon with your family, everybody on their cell phone, right? We tried, oh man, you know, tried getting a hold of Jimmy Fallon and, and all these, and, they all, and the, the gatekeepers all are like, they just, it wasn't trendy, mm. but, I, I create from the heart. I knew if you could get it out there that people would respond because they love stuff like that. You know, you, you can't oh, ever yeah. lose touch with the audience or what's going on in the world in the moment. You, you just can't follow the social media for you to find your answers. I miss that part of it. No. And you did that with the, with the group you call them a tactical maneuver is the yeah, kind of the that's, arts that's group that does those yeah, yeah, interventions. Yeah. Yes. Interventions, that's great. I'm going to use that. That's fantastic. It, that's what we do, interventions. Yeah, totally. That's what, that's what Pink Floyd was. Pink Floyd opening night was an intervention. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what it was. It's fantastic. So the oh. thing about, about lighting and spectacle that always, the, the line I try to draw is like, I think back like Albert Speer's doing the lighting yeah. for the Nuremberg rallies, right? And he goes and he's the first guy. He gets these like anti-aircraft Klieg lights or whatever and shoots them up in the sky and all the soldiers and people are there. And, they're, <gasps> and it creates the effect and it's there. So then when I hear, all right, and then at that next Pink Floyd show, you got these lasers from NASA or whatever and start shooting them up and have to have monitors to make sure you don't crash airplanes. And, and it creates a similar sort of exhilaration. Awe is awe. I get it. But the effect effects that you create have different impact than the effects Albert Spears was creating, right? Well, that's a really interesting question. Albert Speer, who I've studied, and actually I met one of those lights uh, one time in Germany. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, I did. There was like one or two left over at, at mm. uh, Ari, the, the camera manufacturer, because they do lighting also, and they right. happen to have it as a historical yeah. piece of, of gear. And um, I think, and, and I'm trying to phrase this right, but what he created is really no different than what parts of what we're living right now in terms of right. it's only a different, let's call it a set of clothing or fashion. So maybe it isn't big searchlights that are up in the sky, but that same feeling to right. distract, divide and conquer the audience. Um, so I think inherently throughout history, right, there's always been people that probably have, you know, that have had ways of making people, it's not so much awe as paying attention and making them feel a certain way and going back to synesthesia, which maybe is not color, but light, but, you know, through a painting, I mean, it goes all the way back. So 
Spear, Spear was definitely the Wall Fuller was really the first one back in the early 1900s to build like the first right. light show and projections. And I mean, there's been some incredible people, I mean, out there doing that. He definitely um, gave it a look, you know, which <laughs> you have to acknowledge was really powerful where it ended up wasn't wasn't right. very good but. but it's powerful but i guess i guess i'm wondering it you design you design differently i mean your your work engenders different emotions and sensibilities than that right i don't see your lights at a springsteen show or at an olympics and think oh i'm gonna go kill all of these people <laughs> yeah know? no it, oh, well no but again the audio the audio right, portion matters. of the program <laughs> <laughs> is what in, incited the people to do that. I mean, it's, right. It, right? And it's that moment of where it really comes together as a complete thought and action in a live setting where you're sharing it with other people, not as a metaverse and not in this, not even these concerts now because they're just generic now. But it's, if you can find that sweet spot, it, it's an amazing in the moment which you can't capture in film. You can't watch it later on a right. screen. It's impossible. Sharing the same moment with 50,000, 1,000, 600 with other people, you feel that energy. It's quite a thrill, actually. Right. So. I mean, it's just, I, obviously, it's, you know, tools could be used one way or another, you know, but it's not just the tools. But even if you put a loving person, you put a Lady Gaga on the middle of the circular stage at Nuremberg rallies, whatever, and cast those lights up, it's still not going to have a Lady Gaga loving effect. It's a different message when no, you go, it, it, bam, absolutely. we are God, you know? So you wouldn't have made that show anyway, you know? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't. Um Gaga's interesting. She is, and I've worked with a, a number of really incredible uh, female performers, and I've been, re again, really blessed. My, um, Gaga lives maybe a couple miles from my house, and mm. I, was in a, I was in the market one Sunday morning, and she was there, no minders or anything. It was just her mm -hmm. and us at the deli counter. You know, we're just at the meat counter, you know? And I just said... I'm, I'm looking at her, but I didn't like, you know, oh my God, it's Lady right. Gaga. Yeah. And I looked over and I went, the salmon's really good. My daughter had it last evening and I kind of recommend that. And she, yeah. looked, and she, and she, and she kind of, you know, like, because I think she was expecting, you know, can I have your autograph or yeah. something? Yeah, it was pretty funny. <laughs> it was just a moment, but I really love moments. I love the opportunities and moments that come to all of us all of us, all the time. I know that. I know that they're out there for everybody. Well, the part of what you make available, though, is, I mean, I, I wrote a book in, like, 2013 called Present Shock that was dealing with the sort of... The it's about the collapse of time and space and all. I read And it. you I talk a lot about the collapse of time and space, but not just as this onslaught, this presentist nightmare, but as this opportunity, you know, that, That's right. that somehow we could, instead of experiencing sensory overload, we could experience kind of multi-sensory connection. Calmness, a in, calm, a calm mm. at breath. You could, and not in a way that people go, you know, like, let's go have yoga now because yoga has become this just, you know, Thing. once again, this, <laughs> yeah. Wow. I do I it, but yeah, I know it's become, no, you a, know what I mean? I mean it's like, yeah. so, so, I mean, but it's in Buddhist tradition really is probably the, uh, where I feel most comfortable in the, and maybe the explanation of it all, where it's really about the moment and being aware. And again, going back to Leary, I mean, he was right there with that and, you know, and, and Ram Dass and I mean, they, they all, it was that feeling that you would get that it, you don't have to be afraid. You just have to be present. And, and I think that really informs my, my, my work and myself. You know. Right. You have to be present. I mean, it's what I end uh, Team Human with that, with Hineni from the the Hebrew Bible. It's like, all you have, I'm here. You know, God calls on the prophet. And he's like, Moses, Abraham. And what they always answer, they go, Hineni. Yeah. Like, I'm here. It's like, God doesn't see that you're here. I'm here. And uh, to me, what it means is that. It's like, oh, I'm I'm here. I'm present. I've... I'm a... You know, I'm, I'm present. And that's such... A, and it's the kid in the back row. 
I'm present and I'm present. I'm here. And, and Bowie the recognizes that he's there. Yeah. Yeah. Use the technology. You don't need to sell it. You know, I think maybe if there's any negativity in me, it's it's a fact is that the marketing of everything has gotten out of hand, I mm. feel, because you don't need to sell so hard. In other words, just imagine if the, we turn the channel and suddenly you weren't marketing everything all day long, but you're letting people discover. And that's exactly what's going on right now with technology. It's a, I mean, what a great moment in the world where you can just get on a little keyboard and you can discover and then you can decide. Now, where it's gotten to, I mean, that was the original intent of the internet and that we met i i'm starting to really feel like we met right around when it started kicking off in 93 yeah. and 94 i think that's and we had coffee a few times and you know we yeah. i think we had a couple meals even you were out here i think you might have been i don't know if you were living out here but i i, I kind of yeah. remember i was vaguely. in la living there for years yeah like eight or nine years, yeah. It's amazing that, that Jeff put us back together again. He yeah. mentioned your name and I just lit up like a firecracker. Yeah, I mean, you've done so much in the interim. Yeah, I've been reading your books and following um, you and reading reading your articles and really, you know, but I get embarrassed reaching out because- Oh, I do too. Yeah, I just I don't. I'm the same I mean, way. It's like, oh no, <laughs> now that you're so famous, it's like I'm reaching yeah, yeah, out for they a even, thing. Like, will they answer my email? I know. <laughs> <laughs> such a, we are such little yeah, jerks. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god! But you know, we're still the kid in the back row. You know, me in the back row of the Yes concert in '78. Right. You and, and yeah. the, but it's like, but we still that. I'm thank God that person stayed with us. The the thing the thing I kind of wanted to ask you, and, and I mean, I'm trying to now kind of return to the arts from all this theory and social good and research. You know, I want to get back into theater and puppets and some weird stuff. I'm thinking about doing, but it's fantastic. But, it is, but I always worry that it's like self-indulgent. You know, it's like while well, civilization collapses no, and no. four viruses are spreading no, and trees are that. growing in the Arctic. And France it's has a no Hollywood water. movie. All that stuff in your head is a Hollywood movie. They put it in your head. That's it's kind of like go back to the puppets. I'm, I guarantee you, if that's what you're really feeling, just do it. I'll help you. I mean, I, <laughs> I love stuff like that. Are you kidding? Oh my god. I do that in a heartbeat. I worked with Blue Man for a number of years and uh -huh. I always loved working with them because, you know, and, and I helped them take it from the smaller, you know, little theaters they had and blow mm. it up, you know, t to a tour oh. and, and other installations and things. Oh, the lights coming up from the drums and the, oh, yeah, yeah. it's gorgeous. Well, that, was Chris, yeah. that was Chris Wink. That was there already. Chris Wink. And, huh. and 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 Matt and and Phil, they're, they're, they're great. But Chris, Chris was really just fantastic. He was the last guy I spoke to right before I went home from New York on March 9th, twenty twenty. You know, huh. I was in I was in New York uh, meeting someone. I was right outside his apartment. We were supposed to have met, but it didn't happen. And I remember talking to him on the phone. G geniuses, but if you really want to do that, you need to do it. Don't wait. I have been painting for 20 plus years. And finally this year, I, I always feel like I don't have enough time. So I have a small studio yeah. here at the, at the house. And I rented a big studio in Ventura in April. And I have never been happier in my life. I'm painting mm. huge pieces. And, and I realized after the first week there, it's what I always wanted to do. And I, mm. never, I never allowed myself to do yeah. it. Yeah, I'm kind of that way with theater. And I mean, I, the stuff I want to do is so friggin' weird, though. That's I want great. to take, you know, yeah, you it just, it's, there's all these medieval plays that people forgot about. But medieval, it's like the medieval is back. The medieval is back. That's, that's, oh, that's what digital did. I like that. It, yeah. it retrieved the medieval, the commons and local currencies and magic and women and nature. And wow. it's the medieval. You look at medieval plays, the medieval mystery plays about, you know, that were sort of Bible based. Cervantes wrote these plays that were never performed while he was alive because wow. they're all this weird crypto Jewish stuff. But then I'm thinking, why not do these medieval plays, but do them with fucking puppets? <laughs> oh no! That, that, not only that, but I mean, do it, do it. Start off, start it off. Do it with puppets and do it as episodic on yeah. YouTube. 
and exactly and, and, and let it gain its own it'll gain its yeah. own audience and you get jeff behind it and and his team mm. and, oh and then God, once yeah. it starts rolling it's called narrow casting then suddenly you yeah. find a way that you can monetize it to bring it into the real world and then you'll have an what it might not be the biggest right. production in the world but man will that be satisfying oh, oh, exactly I, I, so satisfying Oh, yeah, I, I'll yeah, help I gotta whatever start way playing. I can. All right, excellent. Yeah, I, I love the, I love the puppets. Oh my, I, yeah. I'd love to read a couple of those plays. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to I'll see. Find it. But uh, I have puppets a, are, I have a video. I'm going to send you. It's a video yeah. of uh, Leary, 1996, backstage at a ministry show. It's probably two months before he passed, and mm. he's wearing. I think it's a Blackhawks. A jersey that says Leary on the back, and Joe Strummer's there, mm. and they're and he's not in great shape, and they sit him down, and Joe Strummer, like starts like getting down on one knee, and it's the Pope has walked into the room, yeah, and then and the way we edited it. His fingernails are sparkly, and and uh, we keep cutting to it. And then Al Jorgensen like what was walking behind with his top hat, and they're calling him to stage. But the whole energy of it, I'm going to send it to you. And it's a great yeah. little piece of footage. I was going to make an NFT out of it and put it out there, but um, I've been I've been kind of holding back all the NFT stuff. Yeah, well, I, wanna, I would wait until that world settles out. I just don't want anyone getting a. Uh screwed over on my account you know if we're having fun and you know kids are investing in these things it's tricky it's it's really it's interesting i think what just happened the crash had to happen there was a lot mm -hmm. of riffraff out there and and speculators and all kinds of shady people just doing crazy things ultimately it still is i think the greatest way for artists to be uh, not only independent but to make a living. And the idea of making a living are right as a human in the world yeah. where, you know, you're able to feed yourself and do what you love. And, and, and really that this represents that once you get the speculators away and everybody else, you right. can find your audience and actually they'll support you. Right. And you can use systems that don't burn up the planet either. I mean, that's correct. The whole that's right. Bitcoin burning thing is unnecessary. Finally, that's coming out in about a month. You know, when Ethereum finally merges, that should. That I keep hearing it's next month for like four years, though. So I'm, I'm <laughs> we'll see. No, it's, it's OK. But I, I'm very I'm very pro blockchain and I think it's going to be great. You know, when they build these huge conglomerates and the big, big, you know, big brother kind of sci-fi movie that we're living in. There's always holes in the fabric. I worked on a film. I was really like, I've worked on a lot of features. And so three of the features I worked on was right in a row. It was Running Man with Schwarzenegger mm. back in 87. It was AI and it was Minority Report. I worked on all three of those films. Mm. And I mean, that really, if you look back now. Yeah. Yeah. They're like the phases of the of the uh, of the Renaissance, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting though this moment, and, and I'm I'm trying to bring myself toward optimism as well. You know, the way you talk about blockchain and the possibilities here for young artists, it's a little bit like the 1960s electric exactly. guitar garage band. There exactly. was a moment any four kids could get together in their mom's garage, and who knows, you could be the king. You just gotta turn off. You just gotta know. Like what your channel is, but exactly that. They were determined to play music, whether their parents were going to yell at them or not, and uh -huh. their neighbors were going crazy. And they were, re <laughs> but that energy's always been there for young people, and, and it's still there. The difference mm. now, you can actually access these people worldwide. Mm. I'm hopeful and optimistic. I think that, I just think people are really innovative, and, and, and I think we'll find a way. Yeah. And if we are going to find a way, I mean, it's going to be thanks to not to make too sappy a wrap up for this, but it's going to be thanks to artists like you who are helping us see that this is a team sport, that we're in this together, that, that's that right. the person in the back row, whether that's below sea level in Bangladesh or in the heat of the Sahara or in Flint, Michigan, the person in the back row has got to be part of the show. 
you know? Anyway, let's do something positive <laughs> right before yeah. we jump off. <laughs> well, we are. Well, I mean, but that's the thing. The thing that's positive is that, that this kind of work is what's opening everyone up, that we do have an internet, which for all of its problems, at least lets everyone see what's going on everywhere else. There is a blockchain, which even though it was in, infested by speculators, does create an opportunity for, you know, high leverage points to create value uh, from anywhere in the system. And all we really need are artists, writers, musicians with that sensibility, really, to to help engender the kinds of activity that we're talking about rather than the, the speculative, selfish, individualistic nightmare of industrialism. Thank you. That was perfect. See? <laughs> no, that just made my, that was absolutely perfect. No, I could, you know, I act absolutely. And it's so good to see you. I mean, wow. And you. We, we, yeah, we should, yeah. And, and we'll stay in touch. All right. Well, namaste care, to you. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks for being on Team Human. Our guest today was experienced designer and artist Mark Brickman. You can find out more about him by going to markbrickman.com or come to teamhuman.fm and click on the links where you can also become a supporting member of the team. Team Human is produced by Joshua Chapdelin and edited by Luke Robert Mason. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and you've been on Team Human, our last best hope for peeps.